I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Today we host the brain trust of the newly inaugurated Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. It was formed to promote ideas that move American foreign policy away from endless war and toward vigorous diplomacy in pursuit of international peace. Heeding the instruction of John Quincy Adams that America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy, the Institute's mission states, the foreign policy of the U.S. has become detached from any defensible conception of American interests and from a decent respect for the rights and dignity of humankind. Political leaders have increasingly deployed the military in a costly, counterproductive, and indiscriminate manner, normalizing war and treating armed dominance as an end in and of itself. Our guest today will expound on their mandate and vision. Trita Parsi is co-founder and executive VP of the Quincy Institute and founder and former president of the National Iranian American Council. Stephen Wortham is co-founder and research director of the Quincy Institute and research scholar at Columbia University. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Great to be here. Congratulations on the inauguration of this transpartisan endeavor funded by the Kochs on, on the right historically speaking, and Soros on the left. When we started the conversation about having an institution in D.C. that would be promoting the ideas, the intellectual space for policies that could bring us out of these endless wars and really fundamentally shift our foreign policy, it was very clear to us from the very outset that this would need to have the support of both the left and the right, that this is not a perspective that it only belongs to one specific political angle. And uh, our outreach to both CKI, so this is Charles Koch's foundation, it's not the Koch brothers, and uh, Soros started pretty early. And it was very clear to us that there is a lot of sympathy uh, between these two very, very different entities when it comes to this specific issue. In the sense that we've seen Soros' very strong anti-war perspectives and very critical of how the U.S. have used military interventions. And of course, what is perhaps less known is that the Koch uh, uh, Foundation has had a very long presence in the anti-war space, coming from the libertarian perspective, in which they're very, very critical of U.S. foreign policies, particularly the interventions and particularly the militarization that has taken place. They disagree on a whole set of different issues, but on this one, they could come together. But do they also believe that we ought to be preserving liberal democracy, Stephen? I think they do. Uh, I can't really speak for them, but I can speak for myself and, uh, and this institute, for the Quincy born. Institute. <laughs> and we certainly think uh, we want to preserve liberal democracy. In fact, we've come to the conclusion after several decades of overly militarized foreign policy, where unfortunately experts and uh, uh, politicians from both sides of the aisle routinely tell us that foreigners are coming to kill us when we're a fundamentally safe, secure country. Uh, it's no surprise that we see our own democracy at home under strain uh, because we have a, a president right now in a, in a movement that is appealing to nativism, uh, you know, threatening uh, to take uh, our own civil life in a more authoritarian direction, in a direction that brings the war abroad uh, to our civic life at home, where we seem to be so at odds with each other Internally, it's as if we're waging a kind of cold war within our own country. So I think the record of bipartisan militarism has a lot to do with that. And I think in this particular moment, this is one reason why different people are responding to, you know, from different uh, political sides are responding to this moment and saying, wait a minute, there is a real cost to liberal democracy, uh, to crusading uh, through military force to promote liberal democracy, at least in the name of promoting liberal democracy, or to do any number of things that really don't respond to the national security interests of the United States. Ultimately, the Vietnam fatigue, the Iraq fatigue, and the ongoing uh, concern that our military was deployed to expand peace around the world. and is that what we've achieved? I think that the folks who advocated for military intervention, especially in the Bush years, will say, just as some might go back to the Vietnam era and say, well, look at Vietnam today, look at Iraq today, 
relative to where it was. And I'm wondering if that is a, an acceptable or persuasive argument to you in any fashion, knowing that both in the Far East and in the Middle East, there is more stability and there is more potential promise, at least in those countries, Iraq and, and uh, Vietnam, of stabilization and democratic rule. I don't think the premise of the question is correct. First of all, when it comes to Vietnam, the United States left. So to argue that the war uh, is the reason why there's stability there is problematic in and of itself. But also when it comes to the idea that Iraq is now very stable, that is not the case. The most destabilizing event in the Middle East in the last 40 years has been the invasion of Iraq. That destroyed much of that society, uh, destroyed much of the uh, institutions of that society that could keep the state together. And as a result, it wasn't too long ago that there was the discussions in D.C. about potentially dividing Iraq up into th three different countries. We've seen the spread of sectarianism uh, that is directly linked to this, and we've also seen how ISIS was born out of the destruction that came from there. The reverberations of that instability has not yet come to an end, even though parts of Iraq right now are more stable than it was Five years ago, they're not necessarily more stable than they were before the Iraq War. Now, of course, Saddam Hussein uh, was an absolutely horrible dictator. But we are also talking about a war that left, in the war phase alone, roughly 500,000 people killed. For a situation today in which it is a very weak state, parts of the territory of the country is not under its own control, and the prospect of it actually being a real democracy in which people are voting based on ideas rather than other type of identities or tribal um, uh, belongings is still very, very um, uh, embryotic at best. So I don't think we in any way, shape or form can point to Iraq as an example of a successful case of the U.S. making itself more safe or making the region more safe. In the American consciousness, the attack on us still today is 9-11. Is and of course, there was a detour from the attempts to obliterate and eradicate fundamentalism and um, ideology or, or terrorism um, that would once again uh, destroy us. Now, we live under that constant threat, as do other developed democracies and countries. The idea of peace today. It is soft power. It is not pacification. Uh, how do you define the underlying philosophy that Quincy will espouse? We envision a world in which peace is the norm and war an exception. That's not to say that we're pacifists. You know, military force uh, should be used in cases of national defense could be used uh, you know, in concert with the international community if there are gross violations of human rights or uh, fundamental international laws. So you know, we, we don't think that there's this kind of easy solution where you can lay down a set of uh, rules and take the craft out of statecraft. It's one of the reasons why we use the word statecraft in, right. in, our, in our name. But we do think that we now find ourselves in a condition of endless war in which war seems to be normal. And even when President Trump said uh, less than a year ago that he wanted to withdraw troops from Syria and have a drawdown in Afghanistan, it was so shocking to everyone. The very people who think that this president is reckless, losing his mind, has no strategy, were also uh, scandalized by the idea that he would want to relinquish his own authority to command troops anywhere in the world with an open-ended mission. That suggests a, a kind of deep conceptual problem, which is that we have normalized war, and we find it shocking that U.S. troops wouldn't be everywhere. The argument is that those officers who are stationed there are attempting to secure peace, right? In, in, in reality, I think you both are espousing the view that it is exacerbating tension and not improving the conditions for peace in the Middle East. But broadly... Peace requires a tremendous amount of diplomatic engagement. It requires a lot of conflict resolution. It requires, to a certain extent, a degree of nation building, things that are not 
suited for the military, things that the military itself does not want to do. I think the problem we're seeing is that we're thinking that for every problem that emerges in the world, the military is the solution. It's the militarization of our foreign policy. What we need is to take a step back and recognize that diplomacy has to be at the very center of American statecraft. We have to rediscover the art of diplomacy and recognize that that is actually not only more effective, it is far less costly, and it also tends to have far less blowback than throwing around military weight and might all the time. The Marshall Plan is often cited as a post-war measure that redevelops social capital and diplomatic means of achieving political goals. And that, to date, is maybe the most visible example of the, of the path we can chart. Um, I think you gentlemen are, are saying that in the case of Iraq, that it was a misadventure, misguided, destructive, uh, but we are where we are today. So knowing the conflicts around the world and the fact that we have a president who at once, Stephen, wants to pull out of the Middle East in an isolationist framework, uh, or perhaps too in an anti-militaristic framework, who is touting nuclear arsenal um, re-engagement of military force by virtue of budgets, and who has been tempted to re-engage militaristically with Iran. Certainly in Syria he did on a low scale. Venezuela. Um, I think that his instinct in North Korea initially was fire and fury, and then that was pacified. But looking at the stages of potential conflict now, how are you going to peel away the temptation of war. There's this bizarre combination of a remarkable degree of lack of self-control when it comes to the escalation, and then a surprising degree of self-control when it comes to actually not pulling the trigger at the last minute. That's what we saw in North Korea. That's what we saw in Iran. In the case of Iran, he destroyed a fully functional nuclear deal. There's no reason for us to be in this escalation whatsoever. But when push came to shove, he rather blink then pull the trigger, which I think actually was the right decision. And one has to be fair, many presidents probably would not have been able to do so at that last minute. He did. But it doesn't take away the fact that many presidents probably wouldn't have ended up in that situation in the first place by having shown greater self-control at an earlier stage and not escalated in, uh, this situation needlessly. But having said all of that, um, I think what we want to do is to, instead of just immediately be in the middle of these different crises and then having more or less a tunnel vision, well, this is where we are right now, what do we do now? If that's our approach, we will likely end up with the same type of policies as in the past, with the same repeated failures as the past. We are at a moment where the country needs to take a significant step back and rethink, not just how do we get out of here, but how do we get into this place in the first place and how do we change our conception of not only foreign policy but America's role in the world so that we don't repeatedly find ourselves in these situations? Because that's the question that has to be asked. Why are we constantly in these situations in which military force is brought up as an option? That should not be normal. What did we do wrong that caused us to be in the situation in which we're constantly on the verge of military action? When the stagecraft or diplomacy is, is only on the part of, of Trump and Kim in the case of North Korea, that doesn't bring any relief to the people who are under severe duress in that country. And so th there's a whole piece of diplomacy that's missing from that conversation and understanding. Absolutely true. And right now we've gotten to the point where uh, our reliance on military force actually gets in the way of diplomacy. It prevents us from using our good offices to mediate conflicts because instead we find ourselves on the side of every conflict. Now what we did, uh, the co-founders of Quincy put together a set of principles of responsible statecraft and some of those principles address the uh, specific uh, scenarios that you were mentioning. So in the case of Venezuela, uh, one thing that we say is that you know, the United States should not be attempting to change regimes of governments that don't threat us, th thre threaten us. Excuse me. Uh, that should just be a basic principle uh, because even though the uh, Trump administration hasn't yet taken that to a military uh, level, it decided very early on 
to withhold recognition from a government in power, confer recognition on a faction that was vying for power but hadn't made it yet. And that's effectively a regime change policy, perhaps just without willing the means. And so what that systematically does is it puts pressure on the president uh, to ramp up the intervention. Uh, it makes it very difficult to use diplomacy to bring the sides to the table so that they can discuss their differences. So that's what we'd like to see, a more even-handed approach that uses the influence of the United States to convene people, not to dictate to them which party we prefer and which we want to see go. In the case of North Korea, there aren't any good answers because you have the beginning of a diplomatic relationship and then you see them fire off more missiles and there's no indication that they recognize um, our values of liberal democracy um, and freedom of speech and human rights. I think the very approach of thinking that democracy can come about through the use of force, through the barrel of a gun, has been proven entirely incorrect. Democracy has emerged wherever it has emerged because of forces inside of that country, oftentimes decades long, if not century long processes, in which a society is transformed internally, from inside, indigenously, towards this movement. Yes, it would be absolutely fantastic if we could just wand the magic stick and then be able to turn countries into democracies. And it would be great if we really could. We don't have that capacity. We have been under the illusion that we have that capacity. And a lot of people have died because of that illusion. And one thing that John Quincy Adams says in that passage towards the end of it is that he points out that if we were to go down this path of chasing monsters to destroy outside, uh, it will perhaps lead to a scenario in which the United States would become the ruler of the world, but it would come at the expense of her own spirit, the spirit of liberty and freedom at home. And that is exactly the process that we have seen, that the more militaristic the U.S. foreign policy has become, the more it has come at the expense of the civil liberties of the American people at home. How do you rationalize the World War II example? I mean, that, that seems to not jive with, uh, with what you're saying in the sense of the United States operating in an environment militaristically and preserving and rebuilding, recultivating democratic mm -hmm. order. Why was that different from today? And, and at what point do you think that military engagement is justified? Yeah, well, in, in World War II, the United States uh, faced the threat, particularly after the fall of France in the middle of 1940, that uh, the Axis powers could uh, uh, dominate Eurasia and perhaps then encroach upon the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and then, of course, the United States was attacked uh, by Japan uh, at the end of 1941. So uh, it faced a very different international environment then uh, than anything like what we could conceivably face today. With North Korea, we're talking about a country that is so insignificant to uh, the global economy that uh, the United States uh, is happy to sanction it uh, to the hilt and not or ease those sanctions, which I think sh pr should probably be done in the case of uh, uh, in, a, in a real diplomatic process. And so I think that's, that's what we need. With North Korea, even if we wanted to ask the question and approach it purely from the standpoint of how could we best promote human rights and liberal democracy in North Korea, if that's what we really wanted to do, putting aside the security issues for a moment. I think the best thing we could do is work with the South and the North, uh, which have wanted to embark on a process of inter-Korean peace building and go down a path where we have a step-by-step -step, uh, agreement to limit the uh, nuclear capacity and testing of the North uh, so that, and, and ratchet down tensions. Uh, that is an enormously hopeful development that unfortunately uh, looked like it could produce much more than it has over the past year when unfortunately the Trump administration, despite uh, President Trump's, I think, positive instinct to open diplomacy with the country, hasn't followed through with a real diplomatic process that could convene the parties and hammer out a step-by-step -step agreement. We're seeing now the rise of new demagoguery, illiberalism, uh, which we recognize often as the preface to mortal danger and combat. When we're talking about the idea of spreading democracy to North Korea and other places, um, 
I want to emphasize, we're not taking the position that it would not be good or that the U.S. should play no role, but the primary role the United States can and should play, not the only, but the primary role, is to actually be an inspiration. Have that soft power, making sure that other countries were to look at the American example and say, that's a path we would like to follow. I doubt that under the current circumstances, a lot of people outside of the United States are looking at American politics and feeling a tremendous amount of envy right now. So we need to start with that at home. Right. That, we, that being said, though, that the Obama administration proved adept in negotiating deals, whether it's the Paris Accord or the Iranian nuclear deal. But when um, one of our former guests here, a, a former Iranian academic, said that, you know, the, th the theocracy reigns supreme still in Iran. I mean, I'm just wondering, w the, the Obama years represent a case study in soft power. And they kind of left us with the rise of, of new um, hungry demagogues and theocrats. And I'm wondering if, if that was, if that can't be correlated, if that's not a fair correlation. Not sure it is, but particularly if we take a look at the example of Iran, I think uh, many of the people who supported the deal, many people in the White House, were hoping that if this deal were to be put in place and if it were to be implemented by both sides, the reduction of tensions would give space for internal processes inside of that country to move in the direction which clearly the people of Iran wants, which is towards greater democracy internally. Um, and that that over the course of time, not within two years, not within five years, but over the course of time, perhaps 10, 15, 20 years, would transform Iran internally. That process has been arrested, but it was not arrested by the theocracy. It was arrested by Donald Trump and him withdrawing from that deal. Uh, and it's, so in my mind, it still is an untested proposition as to whether that type of diplomacy eventually could lead to a more favorable circumstance for the indigenous emergence of democracy. Right. And on, on a final point, because the Middle East is wide, you know, it's, the, there are many players in um, kind of thinking about the future of that region. Um, from the outset, Trump allied himself with, with Saudi Arabia. And you saw, you know, very modest steps of we're going to integrate ourselves into a more liberal way of thinking. And then, you know, then you see the assassination of a, of a journalist uh, ordered by the person who runs the country. Um, are you at all hopeful that that arresting um, of democracy or democratic norms in Iran can mean from, from the Trump administration standpoint that in other countries, Saudi Arabia namely, there may be, there may be progress as a result of I don't think the Trump administration is thinking along these terms to begin with. Uh, democratization, human rights is clearly not on their agenda. They're approaching this from an extremely transactional standpoint. Right. Uh, the prospects for democracy in Iran are far superior to the, what those exist in Saudi Arabia, unfortunately. The civil society there is much let me, more. Let me just ask this to close. Transactions, when you think of diplomacy as a transactional effort, can, can that be an appropriate or functional response, Stephen? Or um, do we have to think beyond what each party is getting? Is there a way to think of it other than transactional? I think there's a notion in which transactionalism could be a good thing when it's in the service of a strategy, a real conception of what the party's interests are, and when it's in the service of values as well. The problem right now is that we just seem to have, uh, in the name of transactionalism, which Trump appeals to, we have this kind of caricature of arguments about status and interest that don't respond to anything except perhaps uh, uh, a set of uh, personal relationships and, and other things. Right, so, impulsiveness, yeah. amoralism. But look, I, I think that uh, the notion of transaction is not entirely wrong because what we've seen is the United States over 20 plus years uh, slided to a position where we have permanent unconditional alliances with one set of forces in the region which are increasingly illiberal and permanent unconditional enmities with another set of forces, which are also liberal. And this makes no sense. 
So uh, if we care about uh, democratic liberal values and if we care about our own security interests, we should be thinking in terms of the interests of ourselves and different parties in the region, disaggregating those and making a much more intelligent strategy. Thank you both for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.